and they want to do billions, not millions. And exactly. one of my beliefs is, and this is maybe a bit more of an agency sort of world belief, but yeah, millions, not billions. Like it's way easier, DHH saying this years ago, that it's way easier to build a million dollar company than a billion dollar company. And a lot of these companies probably should have been seven, eight, nine figure companies rather than the thing you get when you take VC money, which is we're going into the moon and we're going to revolutionize. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, good to see you it's too. Awesome. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, life is good. Life is good. How are you? I'm uh, I'm all right. Where are you right now? You're in Florida, right? Miami, Florida. I'm part of like the it? Exodus. I'm wave 1.5 of the New Yorkers moving to Florida, so I get to dunk on all the subsequent waves, whilst also being a part of gentrification and rent increase. So, so but I can complain more mix. about the people. Yeah, after me. I was actually in Miami not too long ago, but how's the heat over there right now? It's very hot, so most people leave at this time. I've never lived anywhere where you have to sort of shelter inside during the day, but I am from England, so actually that's quite a luxury, and I think I prefer it to not need to do that. And it gets quiet, so the rich Americans leave at this time and go to their sort of second home or first home in Long Island or Saint-Tropez or Aspen or whatever. So it gets a lot quieter, but it's kind of nice. Cool. Well, yeah, that's where I am. I'm in Long Island in New York, so I kind of – I left this. Oh, you see the – yeah. So just stand by and watch everyone go to the Hamptons. I'm yeah, not that far yeah. out. But yeah, a lot of people leave. Snowbirds, they go out to Miami. And then they now it's just like the past couple of years, they just didn't leave. People went to Miami and then they just didn't come back to New York. So yeah, yeah, that feels like, like pros and cons. But still, like things like the, I mean, I sound like a very Miami person now, but of a tennis court, so demographic shift a little bit during the season. They call it the season here. So like November to, I don't know, May or whatever, when everyone comes down here. So. Yeah, cool. It's good. Yeah. All right. Well, glad you're liking it. It's great. We live in a world where we can run our businesses and be wherever. Yeah, truly love it. And I think my quality of life living here, I've been trying to work on this post that I'd never quite penned down, but the title is all I got, which was Miami is my competitive advantage, which sounded a little, little bit like it might be a bit of a boisterous post. But one thing I realized is it's just, I'm just a lot calmer. Like, and I'm sure where you are, actually, Long Island, probably get the same thing that my mood. I can just sort of leave a house after work and suddenly like I'm back into a normal world and I'm not in that kind of New York, like everything is always intense and you're going out and you're rushing to the gym or to go out for dinner or for a meeting or whatever, which I also loved, but yeah. many years of that burned me out. Yeah. in doses though, because yeah. you know, I grew up in Brooklyn and I've always been in Manhattan. So like it's my entire life for 40 years. So moving out to Long Island suburbs, it's completely different world and it's much slower. So yeah, I feel you, especially if I want to work from home, if I want to come to the office, I could just kind of be a little bit more chill and especially not have people all on top of me, which I hate. Yeah. 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 Totally. Cool. Well, I've been definitely following you for a while and, and seen a lot of the content you've been putting out recently, which is e-commerce related but it's your deep love for web3 and your belief in its utility for the long term so <laughs> i wanted to touch on that a little bit and i'm being sarcastic because if you've yeah. read alice's content it's a little bit more focused on why web3 it's, sucks so yeah. i want to get your high level thought about web3 and why is it, it shit right now yeah it's spicy so i have a blog called web2 boomer which was originally pseudonymous because i was a bit worried about being I don't know why, but like, I wanted to write freely, but now I throw my name behind it. And whatever. So yeah, Web3, I mean, as someone who has had a good life due to technology, I'm an engineer, I'm someone that enjoys building value for companies. I'm someone that has seen the growth of, I guess, so-called Web2 and being a part of it. And as of you, John, and like had a lot of joy and meaning and well, money as well come out of it. Having found social mobility, and a great deal of satisfaction in that industry. It breaks my heart to see Web3, which is essentially a Ponzi scheme, mostly cooked up by Andreessen Horowitz, but has got many acolytes who are mostly, you know, my generalization, but young bros, I think probably have been left behind. And we live in this economy that kind of sucks and wait, no real wage increase, impossible to get on the housing ladder. And when someone just tells you, buy a shit coin and hold on and we're all going to make it, it's quite an engaging pitch. But the problem is that it doesn't work. It's all just great at fool investing. So that's my sort of economic uh, moral argument against it. In terms of the technology, I mean, I'm a computer scientist by trade and this stuff just sucks. Like all these blockchains, 
we've created the slowest ledgers ever. And it makes me really admire companies like Visa that do 50,000 transactions a second. Or Shopify, which you know we've got so much experience with. And Shopify handled, I think it's about 5,000 a second. And what an incredible piece of engineering. And in e-commerce as an industry as well, how much progress we've had over the past sort of 10 or 20 years, really, of getting down to a single page checkout. And the only reason that took so long was Amazon had the patent. And if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever tried to buy anything with Ethereum, but it's such a pain in the ass. And you've got it is. like 10 steps and you all, I'm someone that's computer savvy and I always thought I was getting fished at every step. None of it really makes sense. It's unusable. And it just made me think, wow, what a good job we've done in everything outside of Web3. And the, the, the final thing I'd say is these guys love to say it's so early and it's just like Web1 was in the 90s. It's not because if it was like that, we would already all be using it. So any successful utility that's been built since 2008, seven, which is when Satoshi released Bitcoin, is already used everywhere. So Airbnb, Uber, Dropbox the digital version of Netflix, Slack, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. We, those are ubiquitous and we all use them. So if these things worked, we'd already be using them. And uh, I think what's going on for anyone over the age of like 30 that's into this is they want to feel like that feeling of the late 90s, early 2000s when everything was being built. And it's natural, you get older, you want to relive your youth, but sadly this is not it. And I think the next big thing, this is my sort of optimistic note, the next big thing is going to come out of another industry, probably biotech or green tech or something. But we had our moment with the iPhone and it was amazing. We're still living through it and we're still digitizing things and improving the world. But commoditizing everything into or financializing every single interaction is not the future. In fact, it's a sort of dystopian hellscape. So I'm doing everything I can to divert talent away from that and into something useful. Yeah. No, that all makes sense. And I agree with you, especially about the timeline, because 2008, cryptocurrency started coming out. It's been 12 years or more. And if you look at what the web looked like in 1998 versus what the web looked like in 2010, it was completely different, right? Mm -hmm. Like I remember, like I started off as a Flash developer and a Flash oh, yeah. website creator, right? So like this is going back early 2000s. And then by the time... I started freelancing and before I started the agency, responsive design was big and flash was like no longer to be found and the iPhone mm. took over. And that's the same mm. period from what we're looking at from 2008 to 2022. So like it still doesn't have like mainstream utility at all. And to your point about like transactions, I could take, I could use Zelle on Chase or Venmo or whatever and send a thousand dollars right now and you'd get it in the blink of an eye and have mm. access to it. For free as well. Why do we need for free? Why do we need something yeah. faster? And I it, dabbled with the NFTs to see what happened. And I won a little bit and I lost a little bit, but I can't see it being like, I don't see any purpose of NFT specifically. No, and I did the same thing. I got into it earnestly to think like, hey, is this like I'm an entrepreneur? Like, is this the next thing? And what you find is that these guys throw around words like community and building is they all, they all say the building. I don't know what they're building exactly. But decentralization is the big one that they keep throwing around. And I think what they haven't realized is that most of what we've achieved since the Enlightenment, basically, and also within technology, is the success of centralized institutions. So like universities and private companies and public companies and charities and governments that create a massive amount of efficiency. And so something like using the payment rails of Chase to send money to someone else okay, we can all complain about banks and whatever, but ultimately these things work with a massive amount of efficiency. And I think what often happens in the crypto world is they conflate the current system has massive inequalities and drawbacks, which it definitely does, with, oh, by the way, just buy the coin and you're going to be an Elon feudal overlord in the new world, which is just a sort of horrific idea in the first place. But it comes out of this like lack of belief in institutions or whatever. It's like a post-2016 thing, I think. And it's just alarming on, on so many levels. And I think the thing that bothers me is, like, I've also dabbled and it's a casino. And so I don't think casinos should be banned, but I think they should be regulated. And when you saw all the recent collapses of all the stable coins and the massive loss of wealth there, people had remortgaged houses and used wedding deposits and all sorts to put That's crypto crazy. and lost it. And the reason that we have things like accredited investor status or rules around gambling or whatever is to prevent this as a society. And that always seems to get 
overlooked as if all centralization, all rules are bad. And no, actually, like this libertarian perspective is incorrect, not to get into politics, but libertarianism is normally spouted by people that haven't thought for like longer than five minutes about something. A lot of these Bitcoiners for a while, for example, were trying to buy an island to make this kind of weird Bitcoin utopia. So you start saying, okay, libertarianism, you don't believe in any rules. What about underage sex? Why do you believe in that? And I think most people would say, no, we should have some rules, right? So you can work backwards from there that actually as a society, we've done a decent job over the past 500 years of creating a lot of rules that generally work. And yeah, of course, society is not perfect and still filled with inequalities and those need fixing. So I would say anyone that is interested in that, don't go and buy the latest shit coin. Go and do something about it in your community. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's not bringing any value. It's not really doing stuff. It's not creating anything. But we know that Shopify and e-commerce, there's a lot of talk about NFTs and that. What do you think about Shopify's either investment or how they're talking a lot about NFTs? And do you think they're just trying to get in on something? Or do you think there's like a future there with it in e-commerce? Big mistake, I think. And I don't know if that team survived the cut. Hope not. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a waste of resources and money. And I think the leadership at Shopify and in Silicon Valley, so these big VCs like Andreessen that are putting money into it, it's a misplaced feeling of hubris, which is, hey, for 20 years, we have changed the world as an industry. So ever since the iPhone, and well, before the iPhone, ever since the internet, but certainly the iPhone sped up this adoption and it made tech relevant. And before that point, you or I would have worked in like the IT department and in this like sort of room somewhere or design department. And now, of course, every company really is a tech company on some level, most companies are anyway. And the iPhone made everyone, a, people will rather check their phone than drive a car safely. Like, it has changed the human species' behavior. And again, good and bad, whatever, but it's happened. And we've been continuing this long project of making stuff available to buy online, making it possible to be able to summon a car or stream any song you want, basically for free, or any movie you want, basically for free. And I think because we've been so caught up in our own importance for like the past 15 years, we're assuming it's gonna happen again. And so I think going back to the question about Shopify, I think they've correctly ridden the wave of digitization of commerce and maybe they thought or maybe they were in circles where this seemed like the next big thing i don't think it is i think it's going to be a shared mania that we look back on and think oh wow that was funny what a funny moment when everyone was trying to make like yeah. these ugly jpegs and the reason that i think it's a strategic error is shopify's mantra during the pandemic was to arm the rebels and the unspoken thing there is that amazon is like the big evil Org or whatever, not to mix my universes, but the big baddie and Shopify was arming the red up and they didn't do it quickly enough, right? So like now we're dealing with the fallout of the Apple and Facebook, I refuse to call them meta again, another hilarious misstep that we'll look back on, but they're sort of data wars and Shopify audiences came about two years too late. And that would have been really helpful to have had before all this fallout between big tech. Now it's above my pay grade to make decisions like that to guide a company, but I'm not running a $40 billion company that was once a $160 billion company. So, yeah. but I think if I was, I'd be thinking about what could I be doing or should I have been doing to make sure that the way the 2 million merchants that use my platform can compete with Amazon or whoever. Yeah. Like it seems like they strayed away from where they were being somewhat niche or being able to their core product to move away from that, especially in a time like right now, like you said, with it being extremely difficult for D2C brands to get traffic to their website with what's going on mm -hmm. with Facebook and Instagram and iOS 14 or whatever the updates mm -hmm. are to shift focus towards like NFTs, which are not really bringing a ton of value. They're not going to help the everyday merchant who is selling on Shopify. They're most likely not even going to help some of the enterprise brands that are selling on Shopify. It's not really mm. going to solve a problem for them. And I right. think that's one big thing about Web3 in general, and especially in e-commerce. It's like, it's trying to solve a problem that does not exist. Like, yeah. There's no problem, but this crazy tech and these things that people don't understand and people are throwing their money into it. But it's like, this problem doesn't exist. What are we solving here? So yeah. Well, all I was going to say is pretty much all those, so you're totally right, they all start with a solution. And where they do come up with a use case, like let's say you could have fashion on the blockchain and you could have the provenance of your luxury goods tracked, you always end up saying, well, why do you need blockchain for that? You trust yourself, right, if you're Louis Vuitton. So you just have a centralized 
MySQL database and it'll be faster yeah. and cheaper. So pretty much any time you do get to appealing sounding Web3 use case, you just think, well, why wouldn't you just build your own database that's faster and cheaper and easier? Yeah. So totally, totally agree with you. That's all I meant to say. It doesn't seem safer either because they're talking no. about hacks left and right. I know one of these other things. I know well, Levio recently got hacked for like emails from like NFT yeah. users or something. It's it's insane. So a lot of what I said so far is hopefully fairly obvious to anyone, but just for some more esoteric information. So smart contracts. I don't know how much to how deep to go here, but so Bitcoin. Everyone loves Bitcoin. You get the Bitcoin maximalist, which is this sort of insane person that thinks that one day we'll all use Bitcoin, which is impossible because something cannot be a store of value and a currency at the same time. Many of reasons too. But Ethereum came out of it, which was like the kind of a thinking man's version of Bitcoin, I suppose, where you're able to add logic to it, which is a smart contract, which is how you get these things like NFTs, where you can have automated exchanges and basically there's this imagined world where these smart contracts can execute logic and replace, I guess, like the rule of law. <laughs> this mantra they always use is code is law. The problem with smart contracts is back in the day, I used to work in an investment banking technology and we call those database triggers. And they're an awful way to build a system. David Gerard, who's a well-known blockchain critic, but this is his thought. And I totally agree that when you used to use Oracle database triggers, which are procedures that run on top of a database, it was the worst possible way of doing something because it's highly inefficient and it's really hard to patch. And uh, smart contracts are even worse because they go onto the blockchain, which is an append-only database. So it's really quite difficult to go back and patch a, a smart contract. So you've got this thing executing that you can't even debug or you're debugging it in production effectively and then having to go and try and patch it and hope that no one steals your millions in the meantime. It's just insane. And as you say, pretty yeah. much every day there's a big hack on the bunk chain, which like means that people are losing millions and some of it, John, I could go on, but like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't, you, it's not a good idea for D to C brands to start getting into NFTs. Then you no. wouldn't recommend it to your clients. No. And I think <laughs> it's going to be an embarrassing period to look back on. So I wouldn't recommend yeah. it. And just a, a quick, like side story of Axie Infinity, which I don't think it, is widely enough understood. So, and this is one of Andreessen Horowitz's wonderful Web3 investments. So it's basically a game that you earn money by playing because it has its own coins that it issues out to players. So if you win a win a fight in the game, you get points. And it's not a very good game by all accounts. It's just one way you can earn money. And it turned out that the amount of money you could earn during the pre-recession, <laughs> are we in a recession or not? I can't remember if anyone's uh, confirmed it yet. I think we are, but it's some people are questioning it. Okay, okay. So before <laughs> this, uh, in the frothy era, it turned out you could earn more than the minimum wage in the Philippines by playing this game. So it became a massive popular thing there to people turn the phones and earn more coins than they would earn equivalent US dollars. And a couple of dark truths about this. So one is that to play the game, you need to have three characters which costs basically quite a lot of money. So this middle class uh, sort of bourgeoisie of bros was cropped up mostly, you know, you guys on YouTube in the US that loaned characters to these people in the Philippines and took a rent from them, took a portion of their earnings. So an even darker version of capitalism where these people are not workers, they have no rights, they have to work, well, if they want to be kept in what are called guilds, which is hilarious, scholarly guilds, they have to play seven days a week and just a really, really dark form of capitalism. So that's the first thing and that I could go on for hours, but have a look into it, it's super dark. I mean, the next thing that happened was, yeah, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. This company was, it's complicated to explain, but basically if they were taking Ethereum into their system and converting it into their own coin and therefore essentially acting as a bank and they had roughly $600 million worth of coins in their accounts. And someone figured out a flaw in the smart contract and withdrew it all. all wow. Yeah, you're hearing about these stories a lot. That's a major one. But you're hearing about these hacks and all these things. And all I know is that no one's ever hacked into my bank account. And if they did take my money, it's insured and I'd be able to get it back. Centralization so, is wonderful. Yeah. There's yeah, a final so I'd be able to get it back. There's a cherry on the top, which is it turned out the hacker in this case, the CIA worked out is almost certainly Lazarus, which is the North Korean a government sort of crime syndicate. So therefore that money is going towards the successful funding of nuclear weapons in North Korea. So that's the that worst went dark. example. That went dark yeah. real fast. <laughs> I mean, I'm, there is a reason that we have built civilizations and institutions and like you say, uh, centralized authorities that it adds value. And at the end of the day, you want someone to call and say, what's going on? And there's a reason that banks even today still have big buildings with columns out the front, which is for us all to believe, hey, they're going to be here tomorrow.
And it yeah. turns out that a lot of what we've built as a civilization shouldn't be dismantled is my conclusion. That's a great way to segment into another topic because I think that we're, we could probably spend three hours on Web3. But kind of related to that about like, especially Shopify being, having a focus on a core product and then maybe shifting to NFTs. Do you, as far as like what they're doing with hydrogen and oxygen. So I know we just went from Web3 to now hydrogen and oxygen, but like, do you think that they've stepped out of their core demographic with that as well, being able yeah. to be an all-inclusive monolith platform that helps D2C brands to now, holy shit, this is extremely complex. Or do you think that was a good step in the right direction for them? So I would say the common theme between Web3 and Headless is that developers have got too much power, especially mm -hmm. front-end developers, because a lot of this stuff's built in JavaScript. And it's just, to me, like as an old school developer, frightening. But okay, that's the way the industry has gone, fair enough. I sound like an old man now. But I think Headless, we've both invested in Headless companies, and I think there is definitely a use case for it and we've built headless sites that have been good i think options but i think overall it's one of these things for the early period where we were getting asked to do headless by a client it was always a non-technical board member it was like basically i've heard this at, i don't know mckinsey yeah. conference or whatever and Same. can you do it so we were like well okay you know like it was basically quite expensive to do so it's good for us and fun and you can build, you know, the analogy I used to use is it's like having a Ferrari instead of a good BMW or Volkswagen, you know, something that's like great and does a job. And Shopify in this example would be your sort of typical German car that does everything you need. And then the Ferrari is this like expensive to run hyper machine that is what a lot of headless stores were. So going back to your question on hydrogen and oxygen, I think Shopify did the right thing again later than they should have. I think for a long time they said, well, we've got store for an API. We've been doing that for years. We were ahead of the curve. And the reality was that API is not as good as some of the other headless APIs that were out there. So they came up with hydrogen oxygen, from what I understand, sort of keeps you in their ecosystem. I saw your post the other day, John, which I think I agree with, which is it lets you build a liquid level, a correctly engineered headless front end or front end that's kind of to a headless store, it is not an easy way to do headless. I think it's the a conceptually correct way to do it on Shopify, I think. Is yeah. that what you think? Yeah, that's what I think. And I also, I don't think Shopify is promoting it as an easier way to do headless. They are definitely saying it's an easier way to build a headless site. But for example, we've recently had some requests of some brands who are already on Shopify, they're using Sanity and they're headless, but they're basically they were built using React and I think they're on using Vercel or something. They want to upgrade or migrate to hydrogen oxygen, but nothing is really going to change for them, right? Except the actual build because Shopify mm -hmm. doesn't yet have a CMS. So I think that this is phase one and where it could be very interesting. And what I think a lot would be interested in is if it's all together. So if there's a Shopify CMS or there's a way to use sections that, and it has an API that could be, because right now you could really only use a store for an API. If you're able to use Shopify almost as like a mix between a monolith and headless, so they could use the content management system or some form of it, and you use their hosting and you're using their coding language. It's very sticky. It keeps merchants on the platform. You still have to use a separate CMS right now. So uh, an easier way to make those integrations. So I think this is definitely their phase one of it, but it's not, think, again, I don't think this is really solving a big problem for merchants. It's still going to be, no, it's still pretty difficult to go headless. It's still hard to manage different workflows. So I think it's a good way to keep people on the platform and to help some of those larger brands, like the enterprise brands who might've hit a ceiling and maybe they may have considered moving off of Shopify. It, then maybe they'll rethink that and stay on Shopify, but it's not really an easier way to, to do it. Do you think their hand was forced by the industry that, and that if they had their own way, they wouldn't have bothered building any of this stuff? Hydrogen, I mean, oxygen. I, just an opinion, my <laughs> humble opinion, but I almost saw the shift in communication from oxygen, hydrogen, and then mm. post oxygen, hydrogen, because it was almost Shopify is not really talking about headless that much at all. But if you kind of, but they were open to it. 
because mm. essentially you're using their checkout, so it's not like the end of the world for them if every single yeah, site that's the big battle. Yeah, as sure. long as they're using checkout, that's the thing. Where I think they had to do it, and I don't necessarily think their hand is forced because, like, look, their founder is a developer. He's a coder. He's a hacker. This would be very interesting to him, even if he wasn't start Shopify. But I don't think the hand was necessarily forced, but they had to do something because if they didn't and the world just all went headless or that's where all larger brands were going, then Shopify really's only value there is going to be in checkout. And yes, that's where the money is, but that's not where all of the value of Shopify is. The value mm. is going to be in the content management system, the ease of use, their coding language, yeah, yeah. their integrations. Mm-hmm. Right? So they had to create something that's going to be like, hey, we have this that's going to also keep you within Shopify. Yeah, yeah. It's similar to Web3 again in some ways. In the in Web3, centralized is just bad. And I don't know why, because it's clearly good in most cases. But anyway, Web3 is a bit of a cult. And that's just one of the dogmatic beliefs. What happened in the headless world is monolithic became bad. Now, mm-hmm. having been a developer for over 20 years or 25 years now, I remember before we had monolithic and it was a pain in the ass right so like you're worried about caching and and connecting databases to front end applications Mm -hmm. and all this shit now that like i see developers starting to worry about again and i'm thinking especially front-end developers i mean you guys don't need to worry we solved this problem like 20 years ago as an industry and so thinking about the theme layer on shopify for example what an incredible piece of engineering this thing that basically anyone can edit anyone can or any developer can customize the underlying customization, if you like, schema. It's super usable. It's created a whole ecosystem around it. Plugs into all these great features of Shopify. You've got one, you never quite get a one-click install on a decent store, right? But like, it's easy to add functionality to a Shopify store. So when you're headless, okay, you are not monolithic anymore, which let's just say for the sake of argument is good because you get some advantages. Okay, what are you giving up, right? And it is quite a lot, I think. So one of the big things is the WYSIWYG editor, right? Which I know that there's ways of trying to do that on headless stores and so on. But I think a lot of people didn't get that to begin with. That Hey, you know how easy it is to jump into a Shopify theme and change the title and press save? You're not getting that in this new world. And we might recreate that, but then what is the advantage? And there might be. I think if there is one, it's that you get these specialist components that do each thing better. I don't know. What do you think? Like composable commerce? Yeah. yeah. So I think that there's a few different things. If we're talking about like the D2C brands that are growing or doing tens of millions or even a hundred million plus, like they could do just fine on Shopify. It's when mm. the, there's different layers of complexity and there's different people involved. And now you have CTOs and now you have your omni-channel experience. Like looking at some of these enterprise level diagrams, they, you've seen them, they make your head spin, whether you have mm. SAP or NetSuite and then you have logistics and all these pieces coming in. And I think that's where like things like headless and composable commerce and using like microservices and best in breed like products, like not being bound by one platform and being able to use all these different things. I see there's benefit there and I think there's unique cases, but it's also a very small percentage of brands. But headless, like to bring back Web3 a little bit, yes, it became a little culty where it's everyone's talking about it. So now all the merchants are asking for it and a lot Mm. of them, it's not right for them. And they're investing in something that they're not necessarily sure what, The real benefit is what a merchant wants to see. And what I see is the biggest thing, especially for someone doing like under a hundred million, it's going to be the speed. So like, it's like we're retooling Shopify just for speed purposes. Because I remember years ago, there there was no way to just spin up an e-commerce store. Like you said, like you had even pre-Magento, like it was crazy to, to be able to, you had to build everything from scratch and that's essentially somewhat is what's happening or maybe not as bad but somewhat of what's happening now with headless is that we're making it really complex to solve mainly a speed problem that's yeah you know, nine times and out I, of ten that's what merchants are asking for yeah and i assume or hope or trust that shopify should be able to solve that on within their platform in the next few years i think so too yeah i think so too. and i think strategically for d2c brands they are not in my opinion, technology companies. So why would they have a half a million dollars tech stack? And I always thought Glossier may, not that I feel like a bit weird sat here with my like modest success saying like Glossier fucked up, but I never understood why they had a CTO and, and it built their own platform. It always felt like why 
could Glossier not have just run on Shopify? And from what I've heard, they've got rid of a lot of people recently in the technology team. And I'm not saying, I mean, they had built an amazing site. So I'm not criticizing the yeah. site, but I just don't get strategically why they had to do that. Why couldn't you just use a really slick Shopify theme? They're not uncommon. Honestly, there's a lot of other... I feel like that might be, I don't know, maybe it's that's because it's in the beauty space and they feel like it's always super complex. But I know some other beauty brands who have like CTOs and really focusing on tech and like almost like everyone wants to be a tech company in a way. Right. And I think that. Yeah. To be honest, you get a high evaluation or something. It's like the WeWork yeah. effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Speaking of which, kind of talking about D2C brands and high valuations. Do you see that shift happening with kind of like all of the darling D2C brands, especially the ones that grew up on Shopify? Like, do you see that declining? Do you think those days are over of like these brands that are just coming out with these niche products and scaling really rapidly? Because I haven't seen as many of them as I did maybe like five or six years ago. Yeah, this is the first time I've lived through. I mean, I guess I remember 2008, but I wasn't, it did affect me, but like I, I wasn't doing this sort of role where I had to think about like what's going to happen now in business. Yeah. And this is the first time that I've realized, oh, wow, things don't just remain frothy forever. And sometimes your valuations are slashed. You know, like you remember what the, especially e com tech ecosystem valuations were going crazy, like absolutely bonkers. And I think the same thing was happening in DTC. And you had people selling like, I know quite a lot of these founders, so I don't want to call out any products in particular. But commodities, basically, with a yeah. nice millennial color, with yeah. like massive valuations that just made no sense. Yeah. And I remember chatting to these guys a while back that I don't want to call people out, but anyway, just insane, like pots of cream and things that are getting these yeah. insane valuations. Not that they're not worth something, but like, you're right that they were almost valued by tech or whatever. So I think there's a reset there. And I think the hard thing is obviously if you raise money in that period, and there's these recent examples of companies like House and Allbirds, like you, you mentioned to me before, like cutting back now, and it's hard because you've raised money at these bonkers valuations. So when you get trapped into doing bridge rounds and trying to figure out what you're going to do or if you're going to pivot or whatever. So I think the days of excess, if you like, are over. I still think there'll be a lot of successful DTC companies. Like I guess the niche nature of a lot of these companies when you have experiences with them, they are really good. Like they are better than the equivalent, like commodify Amazon or version or whatever. target, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Target version. Yeah. So they have value. It's just that we went through this shared insanity of massive valuations. So I agree hundred percent. And I was very optimistic about D to C and all these brands coming out because it was almost like that's what capitalism and being a merchant should really be. You created this product. It's a great product. I'm going to sell it to people and people are going to like it and we're going to grow it sustainably or we're going to grow it and scale it responsibly. But that didn't happen. They just took tons of VC money. Like look at Allbirds right now had to, I think they took like a $12 million loss on all this inventory they got to get rid mm. of because they tried to jump into apparel and they're shutting down stores. They fired, I think they laid off about 8%, 8 or 9% of their workforce. And they are they lost $26 million last quarter. So like Allbirds would have been perfectly fine being a shoe company that did not go public and they continue to sell shoes. The only reason why they got into athletic apparel was because they were public and because they needed to show investors that they're gonna grow and scale and be this huge big thing. They were big enough before going public. They could have just stayed where they were and really just provided a great product for their core demographic. And yeah. someone like House, who we actually worked with a few years ago, really interesting product, really great story. But that's just like getting caught up in the VC funding. Like they needed it to continue to grow to the size that they want to. But it's a really cool product. They have a lot of people like it. There's no reason why it should go away. The only reason why it's going away or the only reason why some companies are losing money is because of the amount of investment that they took. Because people don't yeah. want to go from zero to hundreds of millions in 10 or 20 years. They want to do it in one to two years. Yeah, yeah. And they want to do billions, not millions. And exactly. one of my beliefs is, and this is maybe a bit more of an agency sort of world belief, but yeah, millions, not billions. Like it's way easier. And I remember David Hass Hasselmeyer, how do you say his name? DHH saying this years ago that it's way easier to build a million dollar company than a billion dollar company. And a lot of these companies probably should have been seven, eight, 
nine figure companies rather than the thing you get when you take VC money, which is we're going to the moon and we're going to revolutionize. You go from like, we're, we're going to enter apparel or we're going to enter alcohol drinks to like, yeah. we're going to revolutionize the whole industry. It's like, do you really need to do that? Or can you just make a good product that is successful and you create a lot of meaningful jobs out of it and good pay for everyone involved and happy days, yeah. you know? I'm curious if you struggle with this too. How big is the agency now? How many team members? We're about 100 people, but we're part of Born Group, which is about 5,000. Yeah. And that's part of Tech Mahindra, which is about 100,000. So we're like a very okay. small cog in a bigger machine. So you went from two people to 100,000 people. That's good. That's good. Well, I mean, our bit is two <laughs> to 100. Yeah, that's no, a, that's my, new, my new LinkedIn bio, yeah. Now, we went from two to 100, let's say. Which, you know, yeah, lots no, of heartbreak and blood, sweat and tears along the way. Yeah, I mean, that's impressive, right? We're at about 40 right now, give or take. And I want to get kind of your thoughts as like going from two to 100, like what was the kind of, and you guys are very niche, right? You focus on Shopify Plus, And I think that's where mm. we kind of like, you know, talking about Shopify being niche and, and focusing on a core product and service, same thing with these UDC brands. But as far as an agency goes, did being really focused on Shopify Plus play a big part in the agency's success? Yeah, it changed everything. So mm -hmm. before that point, we just built websites for it. And I'm sure we have similar background. Like we just built websites in all yeah. sorts of technologies for all sorts of people. And it was fun, but it was hard work and just about paid the bills. But it was almost like we were swimming, paddling in the water, like waiting for like the wave to come and figure out what that was going to yeah. be. We realized our e-commerce clients valued what we did a lot more than the non-e-commerce one. So that was the first step. And then I used to build everything and peers used to design everything. And then we would do all the bits in between as like sales and stuff. And there was one year where we just realized, why don't we just use Shopify? Like to your point, like there was a bit, there was a period before where you had to kind of build a store every time. And suddenly it was like, huh, this thing just does all that. It's commodified it successfully. And yet it's still customizable enough that we can add value in a bit that's important, which is the CX and strategy and building an amazing store that's going to work for the brand. And back then, there were very few Shopify agencies, certainly in the UK. I think there was only others in Foster in the UK. And therefore, we were in London and we had a big office. Well, not big office. We were like part in, in an office at least. <laughs> so then if you're a big company on Shopify, wanted to come to Shopify, we looked like, hey, these, this is a real agency that's going to be around next year. And we got our first like major brands do it being a real Shopify agency because we were able to show that we could do this thing inside out and we were much more appealing than a broader full service agency. And operationally, it was way more efficient because we needed only front end developers. In fact, some of our designers for a long time were front end developers as well. It meant that every time Shopify released a new function or feature, it made us look really good and like it was part of our offering. And that was the secret that we rode that wave. And then Plus came out and then we just kept riding it. I hope to ride it a bit longer. Yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, similar background, same thing that we used to do and I was coding them. And there was one point when I was designing, coding, project managing, accounting, yeah. sales, yeah, yeah. all of that. I'm sure you were there. But yeah, yeah, building just random websites. But you're right, like being a lot more focused. And that goes for, it doesn't just go for agencies, right? This goes for D2C brands. This goes for SaaS products. When you're focused, like solving a specific problem for a specific demographic, you have your process has become a lot easier, the implementation, the sales, your marketing materials, you become a lot more focused. So yeah. that makes a lot of sense. So going from that to 100 and beyond, and as you continue to grow, what was the most challenging part of scaling the agency? If you had a pick, I know there's a lot of challenging parts, but what's yeah. one of the most challenging? I think there's a couple of milestones. So I think over, let's say, 20 people where basically the point where you can all get in a room realistically and kind of discuss what you're working on is a big step because you're relying a lot more on communication, explicit communication, and also culture starts to become important. The other and process, so like people actually following and doing, not having to relearn lessons all the time. And then I'd say the other one, so I'm guessing you've been through the 21, but the other one I would say is 50 because at that point or around there, you're relying on culture which i would define as what happens when you're not in the room which is on by definition most of the time because you're so big by that point and therefore you start and another saying about culture it's a bit like market positioning it defines it just because you don't define it doesn't mean it doesn't get defined it just gets defined by somewhere else and you see how there have certainly been points in our culture where i've wanted to kind of change it and it's not easy and i think that gets really difficult as a leader 
because you have to become, well, a leader. Yeah, you're not just the founder anymore. You're someone that is stewarding 50 people or more towards a goal and building a series of values that you want people to buy into and also finding people that fit the company. And those were difficult, I think. And I think we're probably at another one now, but I would say those are the two big points. That's yeah, I haven't experienced the 50 yet, but we're close to it. I absolutely felt that shift from when you pass 15, 20 people, it starts to become different. And then everything starts to change after 30, 40 people or so, because you're right, 100% about the culture, and it is hard to shift it. And especially being remote, it's impossible to really be take yeah. all together and influencing that culture the way you may want it to be. So it's just going to happen. But also yeah. like... The hires you make are different, like the weather yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Who's, it starts to change because it's like, okay, we were all in the room together, we're all executing. Now you have all like unbillable people and like who's managing this, who's managing that and of HR and you have accounting and you have client services and all these things that you did not think of 10, 20 people ago and it just keeps going. So yeah, I, I would, I agree with you, like people and the actual employees, the team members, which are great and I love working with them. That's the most challenging part and keeping them all happy too and understanding what's important to each of them is yeah, yeah, yeah. challenging. It's Very challenge. challenging. Another thing about that point of like 50 upwards is you start getting like, I suppose, like middle management. And I think middle management is underrated that a good, normally you've got like the founders or creative directors or whatever, senior people. And when you've got a layer of people that actually make shit happen and keeping the whole thing in control, And you are relying on them having your DNA, I suppose. Not that they need to be exactly like you, but I do think that there is, they can't be too different in terms of the way they do things, unless you're really trying to change the culture radically, which normally you're not, because by definition you've had success. So you're trying to take what you've got and grow it. That just means suddenly you're not able to go and fix that problem down there because that kind of pisses everyone off because why is the founder coming down and getting his hands in that thing and you are relying on their style and their what culture they create in their team and that being what you intend and we definitely had some ups and downs during that period and you're right the culture just continues to shift and um yeah. but one tool i'd recommend that we love is called office vibe and i love these guys oh, yeah, we tr- were using that yeah, yeah, and we a few platforms we switched, but we re- I loved it. I loved Office Vibe a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we might be switching as well, actually, but the, only because we're consolidating a lot of stuff. But it basically, just for anyone who doesn't know, it's like an anonymous survey tool. It emails the whole company, and it asks some. If you don't set the questions, it just asks them stuff, right? And it's you know, sometimes like, "Are you paid enough?" And so, and then they can put their <laughs> yeah. they put their feedback in, and we read it every week. So, like, we honor the sort of effort that's put into it by always coming back to people and it's great and it also somehow sort of scores overall like patient and satisfaction and like all these different scores of the company happiness and all that stuff. happiness yeah and you take it with a pinch of salt but it's pretty good it's pretty accurate because you can see it per team as well so anecdotally you can start to see actually that looks right and I um, think a lot of companies yeah, should be using that who aren't yeah like I, we used yeah, office wives yeah. and we had some really great results same thing we would check it we would obsess over it a little bit we would i would immediately jump on it. If I saw an anonymous thing, I'd be like, come to me, we could talk about this. We switched over to something called Lattice. Yeah, yeah, so we also use Lattice. So I think we're moving it to Lattice now because it also does the yeah. same thing, right, yeah. Same thing. I would say I liked Office Vibes UI and UX better and just overall the vibe, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, Office Vibes. I liked it so much better from an interface perspective. But like Lattice is good with like, it goes deeper because it has like matrixes for all the employees. So like you can yeah, yeah. all it go it's like a little bit more it's like the adult version. Yeah. Not really well, the adult version, the grown up version. Another company I'll put to rice is Lattice. And I did speak to them briefly a couple of years ago that I think they're like you're, you're spot on that functionally it's a really strong product, but they seem to make a lot of poor UX decision decisions. Like their OKR thing is useless. Like I just couldn't get like for example, if you set an OKR that where it going down is good. So let's say like bugs, like you want that number to go down. There seems to be no way of getting it to like be green when the yeah. number goes down. And it just seems to be stuff like that. It's like, has anyone actually ever used this that works there? And in the end, I went back to a Google sheet for OKRs, which is annoying because we use Lattice for pretty much everything else. And also I always get confused during review season, like, like that whole review thing is very powerful, but like 
I'm always yeah. trying to figure out like, how do I unlock the review? My team hates me because like, they were like, we showed you how to do this. Like my HR and our director of ops is like, we showed you how to do this multiple times. And I'm just like, I'm still not getting it. Is it just because it's me? I don't know, well, but I'm glad you're I would on board say, with well, like, If you're running a basically a technology company, I would consider that you normally know your way around things. And again, it's because their UX just doesn't, I don't know, there's something not quite right about it. I agree. I so Lattice, throw your shit out. Great product, though. <laughs> I forgot to tell you, Lattice is sponsored. <laughs> so, the sponsors um, are uh, Lattice, Glossier, and Adrian Horowitz. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, we covered a lot of things. We covered Web3. We bounced around, which I think is great, but they all kind of interchanged. And we're all kind of weaved into each other. Web3, scaling an agency, Shopify Plus, NFTs, D2C brands. So thank you so much, Alex, from We Make Websites. Thank you so much for joining. Hopefully we could do this again. It was a pleasure. Yeah, loved it, John. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot.